Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 19th of December, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. You can always do that by calling the Alaska Weather Information Line. 1-800-472-0391 is the easy way to do that. And then write down the numbers that you are listening to, so next time you don't have to listen to all the prompts. It makes it a lot easier to get through. And 123 is the number for St. Lawrence Island if you want to check in on the weather out there, which should be improving. Weather.gov slash Alaska is the easy way to find us online. Uh, just one click will get you to your local forecast information, and you can find links to tsunami warning information or just check on the latest earthquakes around the planet if you're interested in a lot of informational uh, stuff about uh, earthquakes and tsunamis can be found there. So read up on some of that if you need something to do over your holiday break. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is a great way to find me if you have a question about any of the services we offer online on the Alaska Weather Information Line or just on the show. I'm happy to answer those questions and get you started. If you're looking for science information or we've got a school project, happy to help. Let me know. Let's take a look at what's going on across the region now. As far as your hazardous weather goes, winter weather advisories are expected around the Juneau and Douglas Island area for tonight into tomorrow. Expecting about four to six inches of snow there. So enjoy that as uh, conditions start to get a little colder and snowier for you once again. The snow will be coming in with a pretty steady stream of southerly winds working up through the Gulf of Alaska. And it's really going to hit the northern Gulf Coast pretty hard there from Cape Fairweather to Cape Suckling. A winter storm warning is in effect through tonight and into tomorrow around noon. We're expecting about um, an inch an hour there, as much as 8 to 15 inches of snow possible in that region. And for the northern Gulf Coast, that's, that's not really that much snow, is it? No, this is one of the wettest spots on the entire planet, but it could come down at a rate of about one inch an hour. So when it starts, it's really going to hammer home. And that means that if you've got your boat out there in the weather, make sure you're getting that snow off the boat so it doesn't capsize and get too heavy there, okay? So you might want to check on the boats a little bit with this one because one inch an hour is going to make that possible there. Again, this will be from about Cape Fairweather to Cape Suckling and a winter storm warning that'll take us into noon on Thursday. A little bit further north, winter weather advisories for the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range all the way out toward Bettles there. You can see uh, probably looking at about two to four inches of snow and you'll still see some of, that, some of that snow a little bit further west toward Ambler. But generally speaking, it does look like uh, we're going to look at a little bit more accumulation on top of what you've already seen. So winter weather advisories for that as we go through the rest of this afternoon and into the evening hours of tomorrow. And one more, not to be left out, our friends out in St. Paul and St. George looking at poor visibility from time to time, down to about a half mile, thanks to blowing snow, not necessarily additional snow falling on you, but there may be some. Uh, visibility, again, down to about a half mile with the snow in place means that a winter weather advisory is in effect for your area. That'll continue through tonight and into tomorrow. Here's a big weather setup there, and you can see with the spin in the atmosphere right over south central in the Gulf, we have a pretty hefty low uh, in place there. That is dragging in colder air out of the bearing and pushing that into the Gulf and then pushing that into the wall of rock that's surrounding southeast, south central, and southwestern Alaska. It's a pretty good setup and if you notice there's a lot of these speckly dot kind of clouds on the satellite picture that tells us there's a lot of air bubbling up like uh, we would see in an afternoon uh, in the summertime or early fall. Shower and thunderstorm activity is possible but because it's cold, that means it's probably going to snow. And across the northern and eastern Gulf Coast, especially from Cape Fairweather to Cape Suckling, that type of weather may be possible. So don't be surprised if you hear a little bit of a thunderclap out there. And if it's snowing, it may come down really hard to beat the band for a few minutes. A look up north shows that the weather is also working its way northward. And as that moisture is running into the rock wall of the Brooks Range, we are also squeezing out quite a bit of that snowfall there. So about two to four inches of snow is expected in that region. A look out to the west shows another way of working through the central and western chain. That low pressure system will 
gradually merge in with the current low here and reinforce some of that precipitation and unsettled weather we've had across uh, the southern third of Alaska for the better part of the last week. Right now we're looking at a 989 millibar low east of Kodiak Island. Some pretty you know, rough weather from time to time there. Wouldn't be surprised to run into some heavy freezing spray. That threat is going to be a little bit more exacerbated here across the west coast, especially south of the ice edge, which is on the move around St. Lawrence Island. The ice is really filling in fairly quickly and through the Bering Strait is that heavier pack ice is working its way southward out of the Chukchi. As you look out across the central and eastern chain, there's a low pressure system there at 980 millibars, pushing some rain into Unalaska, Nikolsky, and Dutch Harbor. And you can see how that just kind of sits right across the southern Alaska coastline uh, at about 968 millibars as we get into the overnight hours. Snow and periods of heavier snow showers are expected to cross the northern Gulf Coast tonight as that works its way into the Juneau Douglas area again. About four to six inches of snow may fall in your region. Further south, that may mix in with a little more rain. But look just north of that. A lot of cloud cover has been breaking up across south and western Alaska, leading to generally VFR conditions as you check out the aviation weather report here in just a few minutes. But north of the Yukon, that looks like low clouds, areas of fog at times and flurries maybe some generally light snowfall, and that would be true for the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range out toward Bettles there. Across the north coast, watch for areas of low clouds and maybe a little bit of fog for your Thursday. And out west, another storm is working its way into the Aleutians at 988 millibars. Now, the wind's going to stay up around the Pribilovs because of that. A winter weather advisory is in effect, and that half mile of visibility at times may make it a little difficult to get around or also to land a plane from time to time. So be extra careful and be prepared for that. As we get into Friday, high pressure is trying to set up across the eastern interior. Because of that, we expect to see some areas where the clouds just don't get scrubbed out of the valleys very quickly and wouldn't be surprised to see some lingering areas of fog throughout the day. You may find that a little bit further north along the north slope and Point Barrow as well. Down the Yukon, though, there could be some areas of widespread VFR but just south of that into Bristol Bay, don't be surprised to find those areas of snow showers still lingering across your region, especially the deltas and also across the Alaska Peninsula. Out across the Gulf, low pressure is once again reforming into a little bit more of an organized system at 989 millibars. Another front will work its way north and east. And that is going to start to bring more precipitation and wind through southeast as we get into your Friday. Rain along the coast, but as you move inland a little bit more and into the inner channels, it looks like that could be a better chance for some snowfall across the region. So we'll keep watch on that. But right now, uh, it looks like uh, no advisories extend into your Friday time frame, but it does look like we'll still be in an unsettled period. Out across the west, another front is uh, working its way across the chain at 982 millibars, and once again, that will feed into the system that's across the Gulf as we go into Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Here's a look at your temperatures, and as you know out in the west, it is ridiculously cold, very winter-like all of a sudden, around Grayling to Anvik, out toward McGrath temps down to about 20 below tonight, and that could ex extend further southward toward uh, Bethel and uh, oh, Sparabon and into the Bristol Bay region, anywhere from 5 to 10 below easily. Southeastern temperatures hovering pretty close to that 32 degree mark and freezing. Prince William Sound in the 20s, Kodiak Island near 16. Fairbanks about 5 to 10 below. The North Slope 5 to 15 below. Kotzebue Sound, including Kotzebue itself, about 10 below tonight, 15 below in Nome. A high of 5 below for your Friday. Anywhere from 5 above to 5 below for the North Slope. Uh, Fort Yukon near 0. Fairbanks 1 below. Teens for South Central near 30 in Kodiak and lower to mid 30s for most of Southeast. Bristol Bay temperatures looking at single digits there. Sand Point about 37. Unalaska Dutch Harbor near 39. Overnight low temperatures won't change very much for Friday morning. 8 below around Savunga and Gamble. Anywhere from 10 to 20 below across the interior. Galena could be as cold as 27 below. Capital City 26 above. And Daytime highs uh, well below zero in the interior. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And on to your aviation weather now. We expect the next weather system moving across the Gulf not only to produce poor visibility and low ceilings across some parts of the north and eastern Gulf Coast, but there will be some areas of convection here across the north and east. Don't be surprised to run into developing areas of IFR as we go with the winter storm warning we were just talking about across the north and eastern Gulf. Up across the north, uh, the Brooks Range still dealing with remnant snow showers. That will continue to improve throughout the day, but by Thursday morning it may not be there just yet. Across the Chukchi Coast, IFR is possible there as well as the upper end of the uh, Kotzebue Sound region. 
across the Pribilovs with blowing snow and across the eastern chain. Look for IFR to start your day. You'll notice gradual improvements across the Gulf, but don't be surprised again to be looking at IFR across the northern Gulf Coast with that winter weather developing there. Uh, IFR across the north and western coast, especially the Chukchi coast as we get into your Thursday afternoon, a broad area of IFR surrounding low pressure that is reforming here across the central and western chain. As we get into Friday morning, you can see that pushing eastward just a little bit more. Across the southern parts of southeast, IFR continues there with a broad area of MVFR for the Gulf. IFR lingering across uh, Point Barrow all the way down toward Wainwright and Inland. And as we get into Friday afternoon, some improvements in the north, a broad area of VFR across the Alaska Range, across uh, the Yukon Delta, south central, all the way in Cook Inlet, even Prince William Sound, southeast holding under MVFR conditions. And you can see another wave of IFR across, uh, no, just west of St. Matthew to the Pribilovs to the Alaska Peninsula, and then also across the west and central parts of the chain. Here's a look at your pass conditions for your Thursday. Anaktubic Pass, we expect to lean over to IFR. The same goes for Attigan Pass there. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will hold at VFR conditions as we go through the day. Rainy Pass also expected to be VFR. As we get into Windy Pass and Isabel Pass, things look pretty good for tomorrow. VFR in both passes there. Mentasta Pass, we expect to see visual flight rule throughout the day after we get out of the morning hours. And we'll see some improvements pretty quickly, I think, once we get out of uh, the morning for Tanita Pass, too, leaning over to VFR. Portage Pass, marginal, especially on the east side. Some of that could be bleeding through from time to time. And Chilkoot and White Pass, we expect to see improvements throughout the day. But the further south you go, you'll probably run into snow there and areas just to the west as you get up across the northern gulf probably limited to IFR. Freezing levels, everything's come way down. The surface freezing line has been dropping further south. You can see the cold air making its way out of Kodiak, wrapping into low pressure here across the northern gulf. The earliest instance we see of the 2,000 foot freezing line is way down here, closer to the Pacific Northwest. And south of the central Aleutians, so no chance of uh, having any significant issues there. Icing potential, also somewhat limited. We're dealing with a lot of snow production here, so that kind of removes a lot of that mean icing threat. But as you get out here across the Bering, across the Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula into the northern Gulf, levels there show up around three to about 6,000 feet, and we're looking at generally isolated moderate uh, around this area. However, with the convection possible across the north and eastern Gulf, we have to remember that there are going to be some isolated cases where severe but isolated icing could occur. So keep that in mind across the north and eastern Gulf, kind of in this sliver uh, where we've got nothing painted in, but right along there between there and the coast is where you would run into that and that convection potential. Let's take a look at the jet stream now. High pressure sitting across the eastern end of Asia, blowing in some easterly winds. And why is that important? Well, it's taking the big cold that's trying to move southward and move some of that back into Asia here. And that wraps into a very powerful area of low pressure that is just channeling that main conveyor belt of weather across the North Pacific. Wind speeds there still steady at about 100 to 130 knots, making it into the Pacific Northwest. So as you're reading about a lot of rain and a lot of uh, maybe travel troubles developing here across the pack Northwest, all the way down the West Coast, this is why. This is what's going on, pushing all of that into the west coast. We also have a little stream of faster moving wind right around the Alaska range and that's helping to shunt off some of that cold air into uh, the northern Rockies and uh, away from Alaska but we still have very unsettled weather. Here's a look at your 9,000 foot uh, winds. Southerlies across the Gulf making it into uh, southeast from the west and northwest. Low pressure just lined up across the interior, up around Eagle, up around southwest, and out across the western Bering. Winds are generally light on the interior. You can see northerlies coming through the Bering Strait. A weak ridge here across the central chain and low pressure just south of Kodiak. Winds are a little stronger coming in from the south at 3,000 feet between 30 and 50 knots at times. Generally light winds for southern parts of southeast, but northeasterly winds pick up here across the Chukchi and the Seward Peninsula feeding into that low pressure system. Southeast winds there uh, coming in around 15 to 20 generally from the south. So as we look at turbulence, the greatest risk will be below 4,000 feet for the central parts of southeast, the northwestern corner there below 4,000 feet, and it looks like a plenty of considerable moderate across the chain watching out for convection in the eastern gulf. Floating hundreds of miles from Earth, astronauts get a unique perspective of our planet. While they might recognize landmarks, space is the only place they can see the very edge of our planet's atmosphere. From orbit, particularly looking at the horizon, did bring to mind how thin the atmosphere is. It's like an onion skin around this great big ball of the Earth. This uppermost layer of Earth's atmosphere, the ionosphere, also overlaps with the very beginning of space. 
It's the job of NASA's new mission, GOLD, the Global Scale Observations of the Limon Disk Instrument, to study this region, a region that isn't just for astronauts to explore, but that affects humans every day down on the ground. For one thing, this layer of the upper atmosphere helps protect us from harmful radiation and energy emanating from the sun. But in our modern society, it does so much more. It affects the smartphone that sits in your pocket and the radio waves that guide our airplanes. The ionosphere is a crucial layer of the atmosphere through which our communications and GPS signals travel. And when this region changes, it impacts those communication signals. Changes can occur above this region from the sun's activity, also known as space weather. Changes can also occur below from Earth's weather, such as hurricanes and wind patterns. Gold connects the dots between how space weather and Earth's weather shape the upper reaches of the atmosphere. But this region isn't easy to study. The ionosphere spans roughly 60 to 400 miles from Earth's surface, which is too high for aircraft and scientific balloons, and the lower regions are too low to easily study with satellites. What are attainable, however, are the swaths of red and green light shining out from the upper atmosphere. Formed when the sun's rays hit atmospheric molecules, this light, named airglow, comes from green and red bands of glowing gas. Some of the airglow is invisible to our eyes, shining in infrared and ultraviolet light, which can only be seen with scientific instrumentation. Taking advantage of our planet's natural glow is gold. The gold instrument, which is about the size of a mini-fridge, is hitching a ride on a commercial communication satellite, SES-14. The satellite's orbit lies 22,000 miles above Earth, where it can record images in ultraviolet light to monitor changes in airglow across the globe. These images give information on the temperature, density and composition of particles in the upper atmosphere. Gold collects these observations faster than any mission has ever done before. It captures an image of Earth's entire disk every 30 minutes, allowing scientists to see how the upper atmosphere evolves throughout the day. Gold joins a host of missions studying the very nature of space around Earth, the Sun and planets. As NASA ventures farther and farther from home, knowing the nature of space itself is crucial for our journey to understand our solar system and beyond. There's a new class of chemical compounds impacting the Earth's ozone layer and raising concerns among some scientists. But a new NASA analysis indicates stratospheric ozone could actually be impacted more by climate change and the continued release of already banned chemicals. The Earth's ozone hole is showing signs of recovery, decades after the landmark agreement called the Montreal Protocol that banned many chemical compounds harmful to the ozone layer. So we know the Montreal Protocol was a huge success. This was signed in the late 1980s when scientists and policymakers from around the world gathered together to try to save the ozone layer. The chemicals they regulated persist in the atmosphere for many decades. They thin the ozone layer and they create a seasonal hole over Antarctica. They basically take away part of our planet's natural sunscreen and that increases the risk of skin cancer and damage to plants. Scientists have projected the ozone hole could disappear almost completely by about 2075, but several factors could delay that recovery. There are some industrial compounds that are not banned by the Montreal Protocol, but as they enter the atmosphere, they will also hurt the ozone layer. But the unregulated compounds have a short lifespan in the atmosphere unlike the chlorofluorocarbons that were originally regulated. So they have a short-lived impact on ozone, and we don't think they'll delay recovery by more than a few years. We projected by 2050, more than half of the ozone-depleting compounds in the atmosphere will come from long-lived substances banned by the protocol. Because these compounds stay in the air for such a long time compared to the unregulated, short-lived compounds, they will have a disproportionate and lingering impact on ozone. So any non-compliance with the protocol can have significant consequences. And the really big uncertainty in ozone layer recovery is climate change. There are many naturally produced ozone-depleting substances that are emitted by the oceans. 
and as the oceans continue to warm due to climate change, those emissions will increase and that will further delay ozone recovery. Scientists want to better understand how climate change will affect ozone recovery. This is a hard problem. As a scientific community, we need to work on this major issue. We now have a powerful new tool to simulate atmosphere and its interaction with land and ocean to study this issue. And that's what we're going to do. How can you see the atmosphere? The answer is blowing in the wind. Tiny particles known as aerosols are carried by the air around the globe. This visualization uses data from NASA satellites combined with our knowledge of physics and meteorology to track three aerosols, dust, smoke, and sea salt. Sea salt, shown here in blue, is picked up by winds passing over the ocean. As tropical storms and hurricanes form, the salt particles are concentrated into the spiraling shape we all recognize. With their movements, we can follow the formation of Hurricane Irma and see the dust from the Sahara, shown in tan, get washed out of the storm center by the rain. Advances in computing speed allow scientists to include more details of these physical processes in their simulations of how the aerosols interact with the storm systems. The increased resolution of the computer simulation is apparent in fine details like the hurricane bands spiraling counterclockwise. Computer simulations let us see how different processes fit together and evolve as a system. By using mathematical models to represent nature, we can separate the system into component parts and better understand the underlying physics of each. Today's research improves next year's weather forecasting ability. Hurricane Ophelia was very unusual. It headed northeast, pulling in Saharan dust and smoke from wildfires in Portugal, carrying both to Ireland and the UK. This aerosol interaction was very different from other storms of the season. As computing speed continues to increase, scientists will be able to bring more scientific details into the simulations, giving us a deeper understanding of our home planet. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And on to your sea ice edge now. The Chukchi once again completely frozen over as well as most of the Bering Strait. Still a few areas of very small marginal ice. You can see some of that around the northern and western edge of St. Lawrence Island closer to Gamble here. But considerable changes just in the last 24 to 48 hours as a lot of the pack ice continues moving southward. And a lot more is freezing up as it moves to the west and south. We're also seeing new ice inside of Cook Inlet. Not a great view on the satellite picture today, so not a whole lot of new updates there if you are checking. But as you're checking, make sure you go to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice for all the new changes there from our Alaska Sea Ice program each day. Here's a look at what's going on across southeast now. South and easterly winds will pick up across the Lynn Canal. Gust of 40 knots there with four foot seas expected on Thursday. Three foot seas for the Clarence uh, Strait with more of a westerly flow there. Notice the outer coast looking at onshore winds from 20 to 25, 14 to 15 foot seas there on Thursday. And for Friday, a stronger southeasterly flow develops as low pressure once again is strengthening across the central gulf. Northerlies in the Lynn Canal, four foot seas there, six foot seas in the Clarence Strait, and gusts of 45 south of Sitka all the way down toward the Dixon entrance with 12 foot seas expected, nine foot seas in the northern gulf. For south central, winds will diminish across Prince William Sound, 10 knots and two foot seas there out of the north with a northeasterly flow coming down Cook Inlet, 10 to 15. Northwesterlies over the Barrens, a little bit lighter than what we saw today, 20 to 25 with five to six foot seas there. Gusts out of the Copper River Basin could be around 20 knots or so. Sustained winds generally 10 knots, but watch out for the seven foot sea. Look for seas to come up even more as we get into Friday. 11 to 14 foot seas across the northern gulf with Prince William Sound looking at northerlies, 15 knots and 2 foot seas. About the same there in the northern Cook Inlet region. Northeasterlies will pick up pretty quickly south of Clam Gulch as you head to the western Barrens. 7 to 9 foot seas there and 14 foot seas east of the Barrens, 25 knots expected on Friday. 
For Bristol Bay, northeasterlies there at 20 knots with a 4-foot sea. Seas come up sharply as you head down the coast to 10 feet with a 30-knot offshore flow. Easterlies continue to blow into Kodiak Island. Chignik all the way down toward Falls Pass, 30 to 40 with 17 to 22 foot seas, the highest of which will be closer to Sand Point. Look for Kodiak Island winds just to the west there in Chelikoff Strait, 15 knots and 3 foot seas there. Those come up even more on Friday, 25 knots and 8 foot seas. Bristol Bay, 15 knots, 3 foot seas on Friday with easterlies down the coast at 20 knots and 30 knot winds there all the way down the western gulf with seas holding from 14 to 16 feet on Friday. Across the Aleutians, a much stronger easterly flow again ahead of the next weather system moving into the chain. 45 knots and 19 foot seas from Kiska to Shemya. As you look out to the central and eastern chain, you'll see about 30 to 45, the strongest of which will be just south of Nikolsky to Atka. 45 knots and 19 foot seas there on Thursday. By Friday, that improves, and we're already resetting to the next storm again. Out across the western chain, 30 to 40, looking for the central and eastern chain anywhere from 15 to 35. Seas across the Pacific coast, 12 to 14 feet. Out across the west, those could be as high as 15 to 16 feet for the end of the week. For the west coast, northerlies light over the ice, also picking up a little bit more the further west you go towards St. Lawrence Island. Nunavak Island, 25 knots there, 7 foot seas. St. Matthew, 15 foot seas on a 35 knot wind. And easterlies over St. Paul and St. George, once again with a winter weather advisory on land for visibility down to about a half mile. Look for easterlies to come down just a little bit there on Friday with a 9 foot sea. Otherwise, 5 to 6 foot seas across the west and southwestern coast. 12 foot seas out around St. Matthew with a 30 knot wind, 20 knot wind as you get closer to the ice. And over St. Lawrence Island, do watch and plan for heavy freezing spray throughout the entire period. For Thursday, across the ice in the Beaufort, 10 to 15 knots, generally out of the north. A little bit more of a westerly flow for the Kaktovik region. North and northeasterly winds pick up even more for the Beaufort Sea or the Chukchi Sea at 15 to 25. Again, all over the ice until you get down to the Bering Strait where there's still a few pockets of open water. 25 knots with a 8-foot sea on Thursday. That becomes a 6-foot sea on Friday with 20-knot winds out of the north and east. You'll find those winds all the way up the northwestern coast, about 15 to 20 as we wrap up the week, and generally light winds across the Beaufort coming on shore from the north, about 10 to 15 knots. Recapping tonight's weather, a winter weather advisory is in uh, place for the capital city, expecting about 4 to 6 inches of snow as we head through the afternoon, the evening hours, and tomorrow. Across uh, Cape Fairweather to Cape Suckling, we're under a winter storm warning for 8 to 15 inches of snow. Remember to check your boats, folks. This one could come down hard and fast, about 1 inch of snow an hour at times. And uh, again, so uh, plan uh, to check the boats and make sure you keep them clear so you don't have anything capsizing because of the extra weight involved. Winter weather advisories for the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range all the way out toward Bettles. As that system continues to hit the south-facing slopes, expect about 4 to 6 inches of snow, more snow up north, and a new storm moves into the Gulf as we head into the weekend. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.